And welcome to another episode of The Bandit Room. My name is Charles. I'm joined here in the studio today by Mr. Caleb. Hi. And I'm sitting across the table from two very nice bottles of bourbon that happen to be the property <laughs> of our, our special guest here today, Mr. John Wilde. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. That's kind of how we got to know you. We, we called you, we shortened We've been abbreviating this episode as John the Bourbon Guy. That's what we, that's, <laughs> a lot of people know me as that, I that's, think. <laughs> that's how we were introduced to you anyway. Uh, now you're wearing a shirt that has the same, you've got George Stagg. You're yeah, just I mean, fully he, representing George today. Yeah, I love George Stagg. It's yeah. uh, barrel-proof bourbon, so it comes out really big, 130 proof on this one. And oh, wow. uh, this one's this particular vintage is my favorite of all time. So wow, wow, okay, wow. awesome, and that, that's how we got to know you. We you you do a lot of other things. You're not just the bourbon guy. I don't want to shorten you <laughs> to just that. Uh, you are also you you're the VP of content and design at American City Business Journals. You've been there for ten years. Held a variety of titles there, uh, starting with what creative director was that yep. your original role? Yep. At that organization. Before that, you spent some time at the Washington Post. Is that? Yeah, that right? during the. Uh, during the Obama years, it was okay. a great time to be there. Was that before uh, Bezos bought it, or was that... yeah, right before Bezos bought it? So it was owned by the Graham family for many, many years. Mm. And um, when I left to come down to Charlotte, um, about a year later okay. is when Bezos gotcha. bought it. Okay, he didn't kick you out or anything. No, was, no. You, you left. <laughs> he, he would have to be he clear. Awesome. So what, what got you into that? You've been in journalism now for for seventeen years. Um, yeah, I've actually been. I've been out of school for 17 years. I was actually in journalism for uh, my first job uh, in high school was yeah. answering the phones at our local paper in Akron, Ohio. And, really? Um, oh, you're from Akron. I yep. forgot about that. Okay. Nice. Right. Yep. Another connection we have. We have our... Uh, we have a second office in Akron. I was going to say that's that's yeah. a bond, Aggie. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, and I have talked about. Um, uh, we can really narrow it down, and I'm from Norton, which is next to Barberton, which uh, Aggie, okay. Aggie has relatives there, so that's been yes. our, yeah. our bond. Um, nice. But yeah, so I was uh, 17 years old and looking for a job, and was on my high school newspaper, and um, uh, my good friend at the time was working at the beacon journal and asked me if i wanted a job answering phones and yeah. um taking high school box scores over the phone so um every Take day after school i'd go down work four or five hours and yeah um i've never drawn a professional paycheck from anywhere but a media company <laughs> wow. so never wow. worked in fast food never worked at a restaurant nothing that's impressive it's yeah. it, it more impressive every day every year it seems like it's a more impressive thing yeah <laughs> it's, it's um you know it's sad i i you know here locally we see what's happened to the charlotte observer and it's basically you know withered away and i, I do think yeah. that's that's not good for us um you know yeah, it's a similar uh, situation here i mean we used to have the rock hill herald yep. and uh you know it's practically non -exam. i mean it, the prep the paper exists but it's sort of a com conglomeration of yeah you know, and just you know local news is important right you yeah. know um you you want to know what's happening in your city council and with government and with schools and um you know Local sports, right? I right, mean, it's, right. you can get Hornets coverage everywhere, but yeah. you know um, who won who won the state basketball tournament, right? Mm -hmm. Like that that information used to be much more readily available, and it's getting harder and harder to find that type of stuff. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And did you start in uh, sports journalism? Is that yeah? You, I always wanted to be a sports uh, sports journalist. Um, the the friend I mentioned at Ac in Akron uh, yeah. is Brian Winhurst, who's now a really well known um, reporter at ESPN covering the NBA, and wow. he was two years ahead of me in school. And so I always looked at his writing and was like, man, I can't write like him. I can't report like him. I'm terrible at this. <laughs> and so um, I started going more towards design and editing. Um, and you know, little did I know he would be one of the the best beat well, reporters of a of a generation. Well, you were um, judging yourself based yeah. on one of the greats. So <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's um, tough to be right there. So, um, yeah, I started going more towards design, specifically in sports, and just a lot of things lined up. When I was a senior at Kent State, um, the basketball team made it all the way to the Elite Eight. It was the best team in school history. Wow. Uh, they lost to Indiana. We did a ton of work, um, ton of special sections. And uh, then I got a bunch of job offers and worked in Cleveland um, when LeBron was there and was a rookie. And so got to do a ton oh, of great wow. work there. And that helped the, the Washington Post um, noticed me, recruited me and oh, um, started there in, in sports. And um, I remember uh, at the end of 2007, 
uh, they asked me if I wanted to come help news, and yeah. um, I really didn't. I didn't know anything. Um, yeah. You know, I never really paid attention to politics or mm. any of the things that make a place like the Washington Post great. Mm-hmm. I just, I, <laughs> I was, I was a sports kid, and yeah. so um, I remember the editor came back and asked if I would help and do more graphics and do more visual design work, and I was like, oh, I'll think about it, and. Um, I remember the sports editor pulled me in. He's like, you're not thinking about this. You're doing this. And I was like, I don't know if I want to. And he's like, the editor of the Washington Post asked you to do something. You go do it. <laughs> and so uh, it was funny. We, we sat in the first meeting. This was December 2007, and they were talking about the Iowa caucuses. And I was just like, what's a caucus? <laughs> and I just remember the political editor, literally, it's like, you know, like, like, like very stereotypical, just puts his head down on the table. Like, <laughs> this is the guy they gave me. And so as they started talking about it, I was like, oh, you're like John Madden on a telestrator. He's like drawing. And so out of that, a feature called Political Geography was born. Okay. Um, where uh, imagine if John Madden telestrated how an Iowa caucus would work. You okay. would circle things on the map and draw an arrow and yeah. say, you know, why Hillary would would do well here versus Obama. And gotcha. um, uh, they've done that feature for the last uh, 16 years now. Wow. Okay. All born yeah. out of the fact I knew nothing about politics. <laughs> <laughs> you get a royalty on that at all? No, 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 no royalties, no on, royalties that on that <laughs> Bezos gets it. Yes. <laughs> um, so you were starting, uh, you said seven 2007? Yeah, 2007. 2007. And so I did the, I designed the front page the night Obama was elected president. Oh, wow. that was, and um, it was highlight. just, it was such an amazing um, run. And then, um, you know, that night, it, it was an interesting time because we were also switching editors. Um, yeah. The long standing editor of almost 20 years was retiring, a new guy from mm-hmm. outside was coming in, and they were both kind of jointly working that night. Mm. And it was a, a very much a passing of the torch internally, yeah. and um, it was just a surreal moment to like put that photo on the page. And I remember wow. typing the words "President Obama" yeah. as our headline because yeah. everybody was fighting over what the headline was going to be. And then I just put um, uh, "Making History." You know, Obama becomes first African American president. Just yeah. like the power of seeing that, seeing it in print. Wow, and. Um, I remember asking that night, I was like, hey, are we running any extra copies of the paper? And the the new editor, Marcus, um, who's now a very good friend of mine, was like, yeah, we we ordered 50,000 extra. (laughs) I was like, oh, okay. And then I get a call the next morning, like 8 a.m. They're like, hey, can you come back in? Um, We need to uh, do a special edition. Um, (laughs) And we printed an extra, I think it was more than a million papers. They just basically kept the presses running. And I remember walking to the office, because I lived in downtown D.C., and you're walking in, and like three blocks away, you start seeing this line, and people were waiting for papers mm, wow. huh. outside wow. the post. Um, That's crazy. So it's kind of crazy to think about that now because yeah. you just, it just you would never see that. Well, right? it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. It almost feels like yeah, a, a moment from from yesteryear. You know, and you imagine the newsboy on the street selling papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, extra, it was very much like that. Extra, extra. Yep. Um, yeah, that was a, definitely a defining moment. I remember. Um, I happened to be on a trip at that time. I was in in school at the time, and we were on a foreign trip in January, the day of the inauguration. Oh yeah, and it was like front page of every international paper. You know, they were everybody just eyes on that, and uh, just really wild to see like the whole basically the whole world watching that that moment mm. at the time. Yeah, it, was, it was such a fun moment for that. We did a special section to preview the inauguration, and um, my idea was to have that instead of a photo because we had seen so many photos of Obama at the time, mm. could we paint his presidential portrait? Oh yeah. Because that gets done usually in your third year. Right. Um, or post presidency. Yeah, yeah. And so we went and found somebody that does oil paintings and they wanted this insane price to do it. Oh. But we wanted an actual oil painting that we would photograph. And so we ended up cutting a deal with the guy where he charged us about 10% of what he normally would but he got to keep the piece. He owned the intellectual Mm. property and was able to then put it in his gallery with our front page next to it. Mm. I thought you were about to describe the Shepard Ferry. (laughs) (laughs) No. So, um, you know, it was just, it it showed the power of Obama, right? You know, and the the power of the post, which um, is still a very special place to me. And um, even, even with all the twists and turns they've taken um, under Bezos leadership, I still think it's a magical place. It seems like they're still trying to hold on to the original spirit. I mean, he's, he's not dumb. He knows, he knows what made it good and what made it an iconic uh, 
publication. Mm. What brought you uh, to Charlotte? What brought you from from Washington down here? Yeah, you know, it's um, kind of the best thing about working at the Post is sometimes the worst thing is you work with a lot of insanely talented people. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was designing the front page every night and got to have a huge influence um, on our news report. But I think I had like four bosses ahead of me oh. a- in design. And um, I really wanted to run my own show. And um, so I reached out to a couple of consultants we had worked with that I knew were working with a lot of media clients yeah. and um, American City Business Journals uh, is not a well-known company because it is the parent company right. of a lot of small bu- or uh, business journals mm-hmm. locally. And so the parent company is very invisible. Yeah. Um, and so around here, we have the Charlotte Business Journal, but um, we own 45 business journals around the country. And that's, so it's based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Gotcha. Mm. That, that was a new thing for me. I, I, I realized that we have the Charlotte Business Journal and I, you know, understood that the parent company was American City Business Journals. I didn't realize that Charlotte was indeed the headquarters yeah. of all of the different like regional business journals essentially. Yeah, so we, you know, we're a company of more than a thousand employees, um, forty five business journals and you know, we probably have a couple hundred employees here on Charlotte and gotcha. you know, all the the web work, um, development, all of that is supported out of here and wow. um, I was hired to be the first creative director and uh yeah. We really had no visual design strategy ever. Paper looked huh. dramatically different from one. Yeah. Um, the sites didn't look anything like any of the 40, 40 plus papers. So yeah. kind of try to unify that all together. Okay, mm. nice. All right. And that's cool. your that's that's your role originally as content. Uh, well, it was originally designed, but I've always been a content yeah. guy too. So mm-hmm. um, the, about six years ago, they asked me to, to basically run both. And wow. um uh, I'm actually now taking a more elevated role back in design, um, and we've we've bifurcated. Uh, just recently, the design is going to be, or the uh, content piece is going to be handled by our Cincinnati editor is moving to corporate. So okay. I'm really excited for him, and um, you know, it's just it's media is really really hard right now, mm-hmm. and um, you know, we're isolated from a lot of the challenges, but we still have many of the challenges that you know places like sure rock rock hill herald charlotte observer mm-hmm. all the daily papers were, were battling some of those challenges mm-hmm. too sure sure everybody's fighting consolidation or buyouts by larger correct folks um so at acbj do you have other offices in america or is the charlotte your yes only so i i sit in charlotte i have one of the unique um I think there's probably less than 10 people in our company that say that that can say they visited every single office. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and so uh, I have, I did it uh, in less than a year actually, because as part of the redesigning each paper is mm. every week I went to a different office and worked with them. Gotcha. Um, so I've been to Wichita many times. I've been to Albuquerque a couple times. <laughs> uh, and then you get to go to, you know, really huge cities like Seattle, Boston, San yeah. Francisco. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to see how different each business community Mm -hmm. is but the underpinnings are all the same right like you have power companies power players old money Mm -hmm. philanthropy economic development um you know a lot of the storylines are the same um but there's lots of different flavors of that which is really fascinating to see yeah Hmm. did you follow the uh the whole panthers debacle what was going on with uh with the Failed training facility. That oh, yeah. Here. Yeah. You know, um, I've got a portrait of it here in the office. Yes, uh, <laughs> what would have been? I'll give a plug for Eric Spanberg, our reporter um, at the Charlotte Business Journal. He's done an excellent job of covering mm. the Panthers and yeah. sports business. Um, yeah, the Panthers are making a lot of interesting moves. Uh, well, their roster is changing completely right uh, now. I don't, I don't even know what to make of that. Yeah. Are I you? mean, um, you know, you go sign Adam Thielen. Uh, I was talking to our publisher in Minnesota. She loves him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's like, you got a great wide receiver. And uh, I instantly text her back. I said, a $100 bet right now. He does not get 1,000 yards receiving it next year. And she's like, I'm easily taking your money. And I'm like, well, I'm easily taking your money. I mean, here's a, th- you know, we go and sign a 33-year-old wide receiver, 32-year-old wide receiver. I mean, you trade for the number one pick and yeah. give up all this draft capital. Right. I don't know. I mean. I went and looked at the seven other teams that have traded up to number one in the last 25 years. Yeah. There's not one Hall of Fame player that was taken number one in that year. 
We'll see what they do. <laughs> I, I miss the stable days. We'll um, you know, I mean, Jerry Richardson's uh, yeah. uh, funeral was last weekend down in South Carolina. And yeah. Jerry wasn't a saint by any stretch, but, you know, he brought stability to the organization. Yeah. And, and Ron brought stability. And, mm-hmm. yes, they could frustrate you because they'd win a game 13 to 10, and it was boring as sin. And <laughs> Ron would make two, you know, calculated gambles that may or may not have paid off, which right. is, you know, obviously why we called him Riverboat Ron. Right, right. But <laughs> they Which were, is not a fair nickname because no. you were just talking about his stability. You know, I mean, yeah, you, but, like when you yeah, look at him now, you feel like he was the stable guy. Yeah, know? I mean, I would happily take Ron. Yeah, and, you know, again, Jerry was not a saint, but um, you know, I, I, Tepper has a lot of money. I'm not sure he's figured out exactly how to be an NFL owner yet. Yeah. Um, they, they're, yeah. we'll see. I hope. I really want to see them win. It was, you know, we were 2015 was an amazing time to be in the city in the area. Yeah. Everybody had Panthers fever. It just makes a city so much better when your teams win. Yeah. So how is th- how have things changed for you over the years? Um, uh, you've been in this industry from you were just describing like it felt like the olden days. You know when you were you're, everybody's in the office, everybody's going to checking in every day, and you're yeah, you're. You're, I'm picturing people typing away on their typewriters in their <laughs> office, but um, but I, I assume it's very different now. Is it? Have you gone almost virtual at this point, or is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 this is one of the things I worry about, and one of the things uh, uh, we've talked about as an executive team is journalism is a skill or a trade that you you can't sit and read textbooks to figure it out. You mm-hmm. learn by being in the field and by being around other experts, right? And so. Um, you know, I remember one of our great editors who was in Albany, New York, um, I was having a conversation with him when I was visiting there and he just put his finger up like, hold on a second. Mm-hmm. He was listening to his cub reporter next in the, in the cubicle next to us. Mm-hmm. And that person was conducting an interview mm-hmm. and he sat there and listened for like 90 seconds. And it was clear the person had said something wrong. The reporter had said something wrong in the interview took a dramatic shift and then it ended abruptly. Mm, mm, mm. And so Mike, the editor said, why did you use this word? Yeah. That's a trigger word to a source. You mm. are implying something. Mm. And that's the thing I worry about of, yeah, that's, we can work remote. It's great. Yeah. Mm. But you learn by being around people that have experience. You learn to be a good reporter or a good editor yeah. by being around people that have been doing it for a long time and learning the little nuances of how to conduct yourself. Yeah. Um, with sources, with writing, with reporting, um, you know, you hear a lot, you know, I think Trump helped media in a very weird way because he (laughs) put a value on you should pay for news, Mm. right? Like the New York times and Washington post, because they were credible news organizations, you saw their subscriptions go through Mm. the roof. We did too, Mm. you know, um, you're, you're willing to pay for what had long been viewed as a commodity, Mm -hmm. but there's also this idea of fake news, which, you know, is certainly, there is some of that out there, but I will say many of the mainstream places that get beat on, those reporters are trying very hard. They're not trying to report fake news. Right, right. Um, Now, I do worry about there are fewer people becoming journalists. There is less of the skill being passed from generation to generation, so Mm -hmm. I I worry a lot about the remote environment and kind of what you just mentioned, Charles, of where we're going. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you could say it's the same anywhere, whether you're right. talking journalism or business environments, all different things. There's a certain thing that you may miss out on by not being in that sort of environment. And it's, it's really almost like a, like you were describing a, a personal development yep. kind of thing that, that individuals might be missing out on. The company might continue doing fine. Uh, Especially in the just, short term, right? In the short term, you'd hardly notice yeah. it. But yeah, it, you're, what you were just describing just makes your your workforce is just getting like maybe just a little bit could potentially be just getting a little bit worse, you know, and a little bit more disconnected from yeah. each other and from the craft. And I also think about like the water cooler conversations. I've learned so much about other aspects of our business outside of editorial right. by running yeah. into somebody from advertising or running into somebody from the tech team. And you just start talking yeah. about your challenges and you realize they're kind of similar. We do it in different lanes. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I do worry about that too. It's interesting. Your whole family's in journalism. Your your wife is also in in the field. Uh, she, was she the editor of the Charlotte Magazine, and now she's uh, 
editor and founder of a food blog, Unpretentious Palette. Is yep. that right? Sorry, food blog. Is that really a fair way to describe uh, it? What we call it a digital publication. Digital publication. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, media empire, Unpretentious, yep. <laughs> unpretentious Palette. Um, yeah, so how did how did you guys start working on the same paper or something? Or how yeah, so work? we met at the Washington Post. She mm-hmm. was a video editor, okay. and um, I designed uh, the front that's page. That's another thing you miss out on is yeah. office romances. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's very true. What a great segue <laughs> I mean, there, if Charles. You had, if you had been virtual, you guys might not have never have met. <laughs> yeah, um, and so, you know, um, back in the day, which is, uh, you know, 10 years ago, um, you know, you would, work on a Saturday at a place like the Washington Post. And, you know, when I was there, they probably had 850, 900 journalists, and there were maybe 30 or 40 of us in the office on a Saturday. So you'd be in this colossal space, (laughs) and it's, like, empty. It's kind of like, you know, going into an office post-pandemic, you know? And so you really bond with the people that are there. And, um, you know, her and I uh, always had, like, Monday, Tuesday off. And so Mm -hmm. um, we started dating, and um, then when I got the job, uh, we had been dating uh, for about a year and a half, and... She decided to move down with me, and um, she originally started at NASCAR.com as a writer there, and okay. then uh, she really had a passion for being a feature writer, and so she moved over to Charlotte Magazine. Um, Michael Graff hired her. Uh, Michael is now the um, was the editor of Axios Charlotte, now is a regional editor for Axios, brilliant writer as well, um, but he really brought out this just amazing writing ability in Kristen and um, didn't understand how good of a palate she had for food and telling stories through food. And, um, you know, it was, it was this magical time at Charlotte Magazine where they had three editors. It was her, Michael, and Adam Rue. Um, and uh, they just did great work. And um, unfortunately, uh, Charlotte Magazine is owned by a company that, you know, was not investing a lot of money in it. And, she did a 50 best restaurants list. And so that's a pretty complicated thing to put together because you want to go to a, you go to at least, at least 50 restaurants where you should probably go to 75 or 80 because right. you want to figure out, you know, being 50th on the list matters. Right, right, right. Um, Who, there had to be a cutoff. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you should probably go more than once. Mm-hmm. And so it's a lot of time. It's a lot of money, a lot of effort. And, um, Sounds they, like a fun assignment. It, it can be, although I will... <laughs> sounds I will like it, it sounds like it would be exhausting as well. I yeah. will say when it's Saturday night and we have a reservation at three different places, <laughs> um, you know, and you're, you know your, your, your waistline can only handle so much. Um, <laughs> but I remember uh, they gave her $1,000 to do that story on. Yeah. And when you think about mm, eating at places, no, no. you know, like a Bruce, Bruce Moffat restaurant, great food, but right. I mean, you walk in the door, you're spending 60, 60 bucks a person. Right. Um, And she also, um, because we're hardcore journalists, we're not going to take a meal for free. And she's always felt conflicted about that because if she takes a free meal, then there's an expectation coming Mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. And so um, we kept track. uh, The last year she did that job, we spent about $8,000 of our own money. And Mm -hmm. she was really frustrated by that because um, she just, she wasn't getting paid, you Mm -hmm. know, a million dollars. And so this was, you know, it was hard for her. And, I just remember saying, like, you should just do this on your own. And mm. within, like, a, a week or two, she had a plan. I yeah. mean, that's my <laughs> wife. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, she's just – and the site's great. Um, I'm so proud of her. Uh, if you, uh, if anybody is listening, go to unpretentiouspalette.com. Yeah. Um, check it out. Uh, there's some free content on there, but a lot of it is behind a paywall. Uh, there are no ads, um, so everything is subscription-based. You pay 8 bucks a month, and um, – she believes a lot of food writing is pretentious, and so that's why she oh, yes. calls it unpretentious palate. She will never tell you what to order at a restaurant. You can ask her. She will give you her opinion, uh, but much like me with bourbon, mm-hmm. everybody's mm-hmm. palate is different. Everybody likes certain things. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what she does a great job of is bringing the community together, um, telling you where experiences are really exceptional, and so... Um, you know, if you look at her, uh, restaurant previews or restaurant reviews that she does, she'll tell you if they have a great bartender, if they have great servers, if they have a GM that is really exceptional. Um, because I think it's easy to focus on the plate. She does a great job of thinking about the experience as a whole. Hmm. That's great. Now, uh, is it primarily the Charlotte area covered yeah. in there? Yeah. So sort of yep. regional. Um, you know, she comes down here to Rock Hill for a little bit, like. 
Um, there are a few restaurants she's done, but um, yeah. a lot of basically Met County. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. Is that how you guys met the Ackermans? We we kind of met you through the Ackermans. Yes, yes. Um, so Jason um, and Yvonne, uh, you know, we're doing their. Um, and the only other podcast I've been on in my life is with <laughs> Jason and Yvonne, um, and so would always kind of come across each other. And um, Jason then became our accountant, and then. Yeah. Um, you know, now Jason and Adam are some of my best friends. Uh, I play golf with Jason every Sunday. He's nice. awesome mm -hmm. human being. And, um, you know, he and Adam are so different. It's so great being around them. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're an interesting duo. They yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. We've had them both on the podcast and two yeah. separate appearances. Two separate appearances. I was going to say, getting yeah. them together. Um, yeah. We should. That would be We funny. should yeah. next time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will say, all of us um, last summer took a golf trip together with, oh, with my buddy Brian. Oh, uh, really? And so we went to Northwest Nebraska. Um, it's called the Prairie Club. It's in the middle of nowhere. Okay. You literally drive down a dirt road and you're, <laughs> it's, it's like, is this what Armageddon looks like? <laughs> and then there's this beautiful golf course, huh. two golf courses okay. in the middle of nowhere. And uh, what was great is Adam was playing very well and Jason was not. And they were mm -hmm. riding in a cart together and they were driving. Adam was talking so much junk to Jason and Jason was getting so frustrated, which he never really loses his cool. Jason's so <laughs> even keeled. I just remember looking to Brian. I said, I think we might have to switch carts. <laughs> and I floated the idea to Jason and he ripped my head off. <laughs> I just remember going back to Brian. I said, Nope, we're not switching carts. No. Never mind that. Um, but you know, we, we were there for four days. We had a blast and oh, um, it was good to be around them. Go golfing in Nebraska. I guess you got to do that in the summer. Or is that yeah, it was it was August. It was warm though. Yeah. It was like ninety degrees yeah. uh, one day. Um, it was also interesting because we were on the edge of the Rockies, and so um, there's the Dunes course, and then there's the Prairie course, and you're on different sides of this little mountain, mm -hmm. and no wind on one side, and then like felt like a gale force oh, wind on the other. It was gosh. really fascinating. How wild. Okay, let's get on to uh, how we know you as the bourbon guy. So how did you get this interest in bourbon? Is that also because of your experience in journalism? Uh, <laughs> well, journalism does it's like, it's usually. Very yeah, I mean, <laughs> a, a lot of journalists do enjoy um, adult beverages. I won't, <laughs> won't uh, uh, lie about that. But no, um, you know, my wife says I'm the absolute worst at something because if I get into it, I oh. go a thousand miles an hour at gotcha. it. Um, and so she got into bourbon and I was always like a Jack and Coke guy and mm -hmm. liked drinking whiskey, but mm -hmm. you could put Buffalo Trace in front of me, Jack. Mm -hmm. it, it was brown water yeah. that had alcohol in it. <laughs> um, this was about the time she was uh, becoming editor at Charlotte Magazine um, and writing a lot about food. And so I started exploring it with her and then it just became this really fascinating hobby. Um, and this is probably 2015, 2016, before bourbon. It was getting hot, but it hadn't exploded. It really exploded during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so you could go find some hard-to-find bottles in liquor stores. And so that became a game for mm -hmm. me. Okay, gotcha. You know, of like, let's just drive through rural South Carolina on a Saturday. And, um, <laughs> like, she would love to go to the Pottery Barn outlet in Gaffney. Uh -huh. And the way she would lure me there is she's like, well, we can stop at seven liquor stores on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, you know, I I like remember we're driving somewhere outside of Gaffney, mm -hmm. and she's like, "Hey, look at that liquor store there!" And it was connected to a gas station, and it was the you're in the middle of nowhere, and w the door was locked on a Saturday afternoon. I was like, "Oh, it's closed." And somebody in the parking lot told us, "No, you have to go into the gas station." So they had one person working both oh, gotcha. stores, and when they opened up the they locked the gas station and then came in unlocked the liquor store it was just dusty and moldy oh. and it was like it was paradise for me because they <laughs> had all of this bourbon that had just been forgotten about oh, wow. and so wow. you, you know you get into these situations and you kind of need to know what's good and what's not um, yeah. because it's not always evident and um, I remember telling the woman they had this some old bottles of Heaven Hill and Heaven Hills Distillery burned down in 1996, and they had <laughs> bottles from the early 90s sitting oh, there. Whoa! But you have to know um, the way you can tell is their uh, this is really nerdy. Their <laughs> UPC code had to change, <laughs> and so I looked at the UPC code and knew it wasn't yeah. their current one. Oh wow! Um, 
And so uh, I asked her, I said, do you have any more of this in the back? She's like, oh, yeah, I think we do. And so she brought this, like, old box, and there was, like, just caked in dust. Oh and I remember gosh. saying, I'll buy all 13 of these bottles. And her <laughs> eyes got really big. But she had to go ring me up in the gas station side. Right. It was so <laughs> funny. Um, you know, and those are, like, the fun days. Um, you know, and uh, one of the things I love about bourbon, you know, it's meant to be shared, like, mm -hmm. you know, and so – um, if somebody shows me their collection and they're really proud of it, the first thing I look at is, are all your bottles open or are all oh, your bottles right, right, full? Right, right. And you, they're collector. not trophies, right, you know. Right, right. Um, I have five to ten bottles I'll probably never open for yeah. sentimental reasons. Okay. Um, but I always tell people, when you come to my house, if it's open, let's pour it. If it's yeah. not open, let's have a conversation about opening. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's awesome. Cool. That, That's sounds cool. well, that sounds good. Well, that sounds like the perfect opportunity to crack into one of these yeah, things let's, if you're Let's open. do it. The due date to file your personal tax return 1040 is April 18th, 2023. File Form 4868 today and save yourself from the last minute rush. You can get a six month extension by filing Form 4868. Go to expressextension.com today and e-file in minutes. And we're back, and we're looking at these beautiful bottles that, that our friend John has brought here. This particular one that we just cracked is an old Rip Van Winkle, 10-year, 107 proof. Tell us the story with this guy. This is an incredibly rare yeah, bourbon so, to find. Yeah, um, so Pappy Van Winkle is kind of the unicorn bourbon right now. So um, if we wanted to be very technical, Pappy... People say, oh, I had a Pappy 10-year. Mm. No, you had Van Winkle 10-year. Uh, Pappy gotcha, doesn't gotcha. start till 15 years. Gotcha. Um, but so Van Winkle, um, you know, you go back many, you know, multiple generations. Um, he was uh, working under the Stitzel Weller brand. Um, and uh, recipe has been passed down from generation to generation. It's now owned by Buffalo Trace. Okay. Um, and so uh, it's extremely difficult to get. Um mm -hmm. You know, I think it's good if we blinded it. I don't know that I'd pick it number one. I think, yeah. you know, again, the label is part of the reason. Yeah. I was texting with somebody last night, and they're like, oh, I really need a bottle of Van Winkle. And I was like, well, here are three other things that cost significantly less that you can find. He's like, I've tried everything. Van Winkle is the best. And my, <laughs> my response back, and I just didn't say it, was if I blinded you, right. I'm not sure you would be able to tell the difference. And right, right. Um, I'm sure that's the case for a lot of the really hard to find stuff as well. well I it's mean, like, you know, are Nike's the most comfortable shoe or is right. there another athletic <laughs> shoe that feels just as good? We <laughs> like the right. swoosh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let's take a taste of this yes. thing here. It's nice. Yeah. So, you know, mm. the, the thing it's really gotten famous for is it's definitely got some sweetness to it. There's caramel. Mm hmm. You know, it's 107 proof, so it can be mm -hmm. warm, but, you know, you think of other things you've had that are 107 or 110 proof, and they... They have a kick. Yeah. This doesn't have a kick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a... It's yeah. it's definitely smooth. Um, you know, I always tell people, if you really, really want Van Winkle, go buy a bottle of Weller Antique. You'll probably spend about 100 bucks. It's mm -hmm. also 107 proof. Mm -hmm. It's also a weeded bourbon made by Buffalo Trace. Gotcha. And Buffalo Trace would never admit this, but it's a six- to seven-year-old version of Van Winkle. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the... What What did you describe? Will it or what? No. We, Weller, we, Weller Antique. Weller, Weller, Weller Antique. Antique. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, I mean, the the bourbon has just exploded. It really uh, has. So for since the, the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And for the listener, just for like an intro person to bourbon, uh, so a bourbon has to be what, at least fifty one percent corn. Uh, yes, fifty? yes, very good. Fifty one percent corn. Um, you can it, have other grains, but it has to at least have the 51. Yep. Uh, it has to be more than 80 proof, has to be aged in um, new sure. American oak barrels, um, does not need to be made in Kentucky. That's a common mm. um, myth. People think if it's made outside of Kentucky, it can't be. Um, you know, if you go to Tennessee, they will they will tell you they make whiskey. They don't make bourbon, mm -hmm. you know, um, and Tennessee whiskey uh, and bourbon are very similar, but um, Tennessee does things slightly differently. Right, right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a Kentucky one? Or the, is this, yep, yep. This so um, Buffalo Trace is kind of the it brand right now. They're right. the Nike of bourbon. <laughs> and uh, so sure, they own... They've got Blanton's and they've got... Yep, Blanton's, uh, Weller, Trace. Colonel Taylor, Van Winkle, yeah. Eagle Rare. They just have so many brands. Um, 
you know, and they've really figured it out. Uh, you know, they've created this demand for their product. And, you know, this bottle of Van Winkle is only $69 at retail. Yeah. Well, you'll never, you'll never, you'll never see buy it. it for yeah. That. You know, I mean, you see it in stores for $1,000 or $1,200. Oh. And, <laughs> oh, jeez. You just drank um, 50 bucks worth of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, people go crazy over it. Yeah. And, um, you know, the thing I scratch my head at is Buffalo Trace could charge $169. Yeah, yeah. That, that. And, and, like, they could charge $150 for Blanton's, and people would still line up people to pay for it. People would still buy it. Do, mm. So what is your thoughts on that, then? Do you, do you think they should? Do you think that would help with the allocation, the, the troublesome of that? Or... or uh, you know, it's um, it seems they, ridiculous because, like, you know, like you described, like, take a bottle of Blanton's or something. It retails for what sixty nine, sixty five, yeah, okay, yeah, sixty five, some, sixty nine, somewhere in there. But <laughs> if you go online, the cheapest you could find it would be like three hundred dollars yep. or something. I mean, like, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah and if it, people and if they raise their price, say they doubled their price, I mean, it'd probably cut down a little bit on that. Uh, well, and they could make more happens. money. I mean, w- what really bothers me is I'm on a bunch of forums and you know. Somebody posted a picture. I know the exact liquor store in <laughs> South Carolina, in the middle of nowhere. And the guy's got a tremendous lineup. And he's got the bottles pretty aggressively priced. Yeah. And people were really giving him a hard time. And I'm like, you know, this guy probably gets five of those bottles a year. Yeah. And he's also probably, to now get these bottles, has to go sell 60 cases of some terrible vodka <laughs> that the distributor's trying to push to right. get one of those bottles. Right. Mm-hmm. He's not going to sell you that bottle for 50 bucks. He's right. going to put it up for 400 and guess what? Mm-hmm. This is capitalism. Somebody's, Somebody's going to give him $400 yeah. Yeah. for guess it. Guess what? That's how it works. Um, so, you know, I think I think liquor store owners are in a tough spot with bourbon. I don't envy their position. Yeah. Uh, I want to give a shout out to O'Darby's here in Rock Hill. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite stores. I spend a lot of money there, <laughs> um, mostly because I think Mo and Devin do it right. They keep track of who spends how much. Mm-hmm. And so I got this bottle of Van Winkle because at the end of the year, Mo does his Van Winkle allocation based on who spent the most money. And wow. so <laughs> he sells all the bottles for just above retail and rewards his best customers. Oh. Okay, if nice. I owned a liquor store, that is yeah. how I would do it. So I appreciate that. Yeah, he does it that way. That's nice. All right. Cool. So you you've got this one, luckily at retail then. Yes. Um. So, nice. uh, yeah. It, uh, on the secondary market, um, you're looking anywhere from seven hundred and fifty to a thousand bucks for that. Wow. Bottle. Wow. And again, it's a great bourbon. I could yeah. give you five other bourbons that are in the hundred dollar range. Right. That if <laughs> you did not have a label, you might not be able to tell the difference between them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. No, He's that was good. good. Thank you for sharing. That yes. was terrific. We'll do a little blind tasting here of some stuff that we oh, have. Then, now, now, you're gonna put, now you're going to put the pressure on. Yeah, them. yeah, very yeah. Good. It's going to, this probably spoiled the whole experience having this first though. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we're not professionals. Um, speaking of that, uh, one question I wanted to ask earlier, have you, do you do any like traveling for food or special bourbon, things like that? Doing little foodie type tours? Yeah. So, um, Definitely, uh, my wife and I have a three-year-old, and we have another one on the way, so work travel has cut down quite a bit, but yeah. when I was doing a lot of work travel, would love to go out to eat and experience mm-hmm. a city. Um, my wife and I, when we go, um, one of the best stories she ever did for Charlotte Magazine, um, there was a Charlotte chef who was born in Croatia, and he would do these tours of Croatia, oh, yeah. and so we went and did one with him, and it was wow. a culinary tour, and it oh, was that's incredible. Cool. That's awesome. That's cool. We were just talking to Chris Coleman about yeah, an upcoming yeah. trip he's doing I to think, Croatia. It yeah, must be the Cr- same Chris person. is doing it with yeah. with Richie, and um, it's it's just an unbelievable trip. Uh, yeah. Ours was, I think, six days. I think the one Chris is doing is right around the same amount. You, nice. Um, you know, you one of the amazing things to me about food is. People have, like with bourbon, they have this misconception that you need to give me the biggest, shiniest thing. Mm-hmm. I just love somebody that's great at their craft. So yeah. if your craft is making an unbelievable cheesesteak and, you know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, some dumpster that we're eating it out of, you know, it's, I don't care about that. It's show yeah. me the craft, show me, you know, mm-hmm. what you're doing. And um, I think, you know, that was the thing I remember about Croatia is Richie just took us to these little spots and, um I remember at one point we were eating in the basement uh, at a winery, a family-run winery, and I asked the owner, um, we were in his house, I said, how old is this house? And he said, well, it was probably built in the 14th or 15th century. We're not exactly sure. And his wife cooked dinner for us, and we drank his wine, and it was just like, 
that's an experience I'll remember for the rest of my life. That's and so cool. you know, we so cool. there was nothing amazing about the food. It was the story. It was the yeah. memory. And I think yeah. that's what to me, food and drink is about: is evoking memories, making memories, sharing. Yeah. When you're talking about wild experiences on that college trip, uh, we were in France and uh, we went to Champagne. Yep. And uh, I got to drink Verve Clicquot out of like in the caverns right. where it was aged, you know, that, like that. That's just got to be awesome. Special, yeah, yeah. It's a special <laughs> thing. I, honestly, I've never had it since because it's so expensive. <laughs> but, uh, well, and also, like, you go drink Guinness in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's way different it than what it is here. It feels different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It just hits different. Uh, drinking bourbon in Kentucky is not quite to that level, not but quite it's, the same. It, it's all, I, I will say, drinking bourbon in Kentucky is pretty cool. I imagine you've done some hunting there. Yeah, Kentucky is a tough place to hunt because everybody knows what they're doing. Right. You know, and, uh, um, there, you know, that is, that is definitely Mecca. Yeah. Um, you know, it's also At you, least hitting you, up the distilleries. For yeah. Them. Um, the distilleries have gotten smart though. They used to put out their high end stuff. Um, and now they've kind of realized that people would camp out overnight mm. and do all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> um, and so it, it's, the game has gotten a lot harder of trying to get bottles and trade bottles. Um, yeah. you know, I'm, I feel fortunate that we got in early and we have a, a really good collection um, because just, you know, to your point, Charles, yeah. finding a bottle of Blanton's, right. it's just hard. And it's like the number of times in 2017, I walked by a bottle of Blanton's and like scoffed at the fact it was $80 <laughs> and not 65. <laughs> right. Yeah. And now you just can't find it. Yeah. And, it's just and now, now I would happily pay. 80. Right, I'd right. probably pay 110, 120, right, right. you know? And, um, right. So that's wild. Do you have, uh, do you have kind of like a daily drinker or it's like a preferred sort of uh, thing you go to? Or are you always mixing it up? With I, I usually always mix it up. Um, I really love um, what are called store picks. And mm-hmm. so um, O'Darby's has a ton of these, um, but a store will buy an entire barrel. Southern mm-hmm. Spirits also does this. Mm-hmm. And they will taste three or four barrels and they'll say, this barrel is the one we want. Um, a lot of bourbon, like Van Winkle, is blended where you're taking 10, 20, 50 barrels mm-hmm. to get that specific flavor. Right. Where the master distiller says, yep, this is Van Winkle tenure. This is what it tastes like. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those single barrels are always really unique. They could be smoky mm-hmm. or um, really bold, um, leathery, or really sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Southern Spirits in our local bourbon world here has put out some really... Um, phenomenal picks that you know um, Eddie's roller coaster I remember as well Russell's reserve they did yeah. um, my buddy loves this one called medicinal whiskey <laughs> uh, that they put out from also from Russell's reserve and what's interesting is there's 200 bottles of, in that barrel yeah. roughly yeah once those 200 bottles are gone you're oh. never getting that particular barrel again so it's wow. it's a really unique thing and so uh, I love just messing around with that um, yeah, I think the best whiskeys are the ones you're sharing with people. Um, I think, you know, if you're looking for great bargains, I think Old Granddad, for mm-hmm. the money, you can always find it. Um, Old Forester, uh, especially like their 1897 and 1910, you can always find that. Those are great pours. Mm-hmm. People are used to Jack being a commodity mm-hmm. because of Jack and Coke. and just. Yeah. Uh, but Jack, uh, you know, in their more squat bottles, their single barrel selects, mm-hmm. their rise, um, they're doing really great stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. You want to do a little uh, rapid fire questioning here? Let's go. And then we can. Uh, I'm gonna. Gotta, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pour, I, I, I gotta pour myself a, a little nip of. Are you ready for that? Okay. Yeah. yeah there you go. A little nip of the George. Of, of the George T. Stag here. Yeah. Fantastic. Awesome. All right, let's go. All right. So, what is something that you would say you spend too much money on? Uh, I think we know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm John the Bourbon guy for a reason. So, definitely <laughs> bourbon. Um, I'm very thankful that my wife uh, tolerates it. Awesome. Would you be willing to say what's the most you've ever spent on a bottle? Mm. Um, it was in an auction, um, and I bought it to mostly trade it, and then Kristen talked me out of it. <laughs> um, it's a bottle of Booker's, and um, so Booker's is made by Jim Beam. Uh, it was $3,000, and mm. it is the first batch of Booker's ever made um, back in oh. the early 80s. Oh, and gosh. it was friends and family only, and the na- the label is handwritten, and he signed it. Oh, my god! And so they're all numbered. And so I think I have number 579 
Um, and so there were only a lo- just a over a thousand made. Have you opened it? Yet? No, I will. Yeah. I, that that is one of like not opening. That is probably one of five I would never open. Um, <laughs> Pass them on to the kids. Yeah, it's, that. you know, it to me like it's such a it's a histo- That is a historical piece. If I had the second batch, the third batch, I'd totally open those. But the right. first one, um, the other bottle that means a lot to me that I'm excited to open. Um, when my grandfather died, he had he was a uh, a bricklayer and so he had this beautiful stone bar in his basement that he had built oh, wow. and he was not a rich man but he loved this bar and it was his and um i love vintage old granddad um it was made by the national distillers mm-hmm. they sold it to jim beam in 1991 i believe kind of messed made some changes to it it's not been the same yeah and uh, when we were cleaning out his bar I found a bottle of um, Old Granddad from 1982. Oh, so, wow. And he, my mom thinks he got it for like his 60 or 65th birthday, somewhere huh. around in there. Um, it had the old tax strip on it because um, oh, okay. you used to have to tax strip the bottles. Huh. And uh, so his 100th birthday is in three years, and I plan to open that on oh, his 100th wow. birthday. Wow. And again, I think that's like that's what you special. do. Like that's what I like to do with bourbon is like, right. um, you know, I had a good friend move out of town uh, earlier this year. Um, we opened a bottle of Van Winkle Rye. Every time I see that bottle, I think about when he was here, mm-hmm. and I think about him. That's awesome. Now, when you were growing up, what was your dream job? Uh, probably to be editor of the LA Times. Okay. Um, wow. You know, still I, your dream? Uh, my, a good friend of mine, Kevin Merritt, is the editor. He's doing a great job. I worked with him <laughs> uh, at the Post. He was national editor when Obama um, got elected. Um I don't think I could live in California now. Oh, I think that gotcha. I think that's the killer for me. Is <laughs> yeah. I used to want to live in California, but now yeah. that I have a family and live in North Carolina. What, what drew you to the L.A. Times? Growing up in Akron, uh, my stepdad had his parents lived in um, just south of L.A., and we would go out there once a year. And nice. the L.A. Times was just this big, beautiful mm-hmm. paper, and um, you know they had big, big personalities um, writing sports. Mm-hmm. And um, I loved going to Cali as a kid and. Um, you know, in, into my 20s and early 30s, um, I had chances to interview there. I actually turned a job down there. Um, I still think it's a great paper, but I couldn't live in California. <laughs> now, uh, who would you say is your role model? Um, you know, probably my stepdad. Uh, you know, he he really helped raise me quite a bit, um, instilled my work ethic in me. Uh, and then, you know, my best friend Brian just, uh, you know, journalistically is really... I think we've done a good job of helping each other's careers through different lenses uh, and really pushed each other. So talk about how did you come to know Brian? So you went to college together? Yeah, so we worked together and uh, we went to the same high school and then he got me uh, my first job at the Akron Beacon Journal and then we've just kind of, we've never actually worked at the same paper at the same time, which is kind <laughs> of ironic. Um uh, when I graduated from college, I worked at the Cleveland Plain Dealer. He worked at the Akron Beacon Journal, and um, nice. he covered LeBron, and that's kind of what he's become known for. Yeah. Uh, but he covered LeBron in the very early days, and mm-hmm. so it was interesting. He would be writing stories about LeBron from our kitchen table, mm-hmm. and I'd be going to work to design <laughs> stories, probably about <laughs> LeBron. And like it was always like I, I, you know, there were multiple times where he would pick up the phone. And he would have to go to another room because we were competitors. And it was wow. this really odd juxtaposition. <laughs> um, but we've never actually worked together. You didn't um, work on like a school paper together? Uh, we did when we were in high school. Oh, okay. It was the only gotcha, time. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that was probably 25 years ago now. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So, but never professionally. Never in the professional. Same new, never got in the paid at the same place. Um, if you had a TV show about your life, what actor would play you? This was a tough one. Um, you know, I asked my wife this last night because I'm the least pop cultured person you know, <laughs> and, and she jokingly said Eminem. Uh, so I'll take that. You, put that um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, yeah. I mean, I definitely, you know, growing up in Akron, I grew up in kind of a really rough environment, and mm. so uh, certainly not what Eminem went through. But there are definitely a lot of parallels of, okay. you know some toughness there and okay. definitely a chip on my shoulder. I think that's, okay. that's something all of us Akronites have. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's the worst advice you've received and what would you give? So I love this question. I'm going to steal it and use it on job interviews. I, I, I won't give you credit, Charles. No, I, Let's just be clear. Perfectly I won't. Fine, perfectly fine. No, I think, I think Bezos like, should get all the credit. Yeah. For um, I do think this is a great question. It's the one that you, you, you mentioned this one to me the other day and I thought about it. 
And I don't know that I can think about the worst advice other than when Brian, my best friend, talked me into buying a condo in Florida in 2007. I, <laughs> that, was not, that was not a good idea. Um, Are you going in together on that? Yeah, we was did. That, we yeah, went oh, in 50 no. 50, and it, oh. it took us about 12 years to get out of that. Uh, we sold it right before the pandemic. Uh, oh, so, gosh. so not only did we buy it at the worst time, we sold it right before uh, real estate skyrocketed. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Sell when there's a crash. Yeah. Um, but what I think about is the worst boss I've ever had. And mm. now that I manage large groups of people, I think about his behavior and kind of his selfishness and his. Um, inability to relate to a young employee like myself. And he, you know, I firmly believe um, people don't really leave jobs. They leave managers. Mm -hmm. And I definitely left Cleveland because of him. Mm -hmm. So um, how would you describe that uh, worst boss if you were to describe him without giving too many details? (laughs) Uh, Well, (laughs) he uh, unfortunately is no longer with us, which I am sad about. Um, But he was very narcissistic, narcissistic. did not enjoy the fact that um, maybe my star was shining brighter than his. And so any I felt like a lot of times if he had a chance to embarrass me or even humiliate me, he would take that. And I remember one time he came out and just threw the paper down in front of me and just berated me for one very, very, very minor mistake. And I had multiple editors come and apologize to me. And I was just like, you know, I'm 22 years old. Again, grew up kind of tough. It took every ounce of me not to punch him right, in the, right square in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's just he was just a very insecure man. And um, you know, one of the things I told all of our designers, we won some big awards last year, and I, I told them I take great pride in the fact I can't I can't do their work anymore. Like mm-hmm. they have surpassed me, and I take pride in the fact yeah. that they are mm-hmm. doing work that I can't do because mm-hmm. that to me is yeah. like it's it's like what you want as a parent right, right. like you want mm-hmm. your kid to grow up better than you and be mm-hmm. stronger than you and yeah same concept yep. yeah 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 totally yeah. agree there uh what's something in your industry that you would consider underrated or underappreciated i just think the value of news um yeah. you know in a world where we have more access to information there's less access to news and that's a frightening thing for me hmm. Um, and so, you know, when you see bills like the one out in California that is possibly going to require tech companies to pay for the journalism that they are making billions of dollars off of, mm. um, you know, I think that's a very real thing. And Facebook has made billions of dollars off of the back of newspaper journalists. Yeah. And they give us n- almost none of the money. Right. And, um, you know, the world, a world without information looks like a communist country, and I don't think we want to live in that type mm. of a world. That's true. That's true. Uh, what's one thing outside of what you already do that you'd love to be an expert at? Um, cooking. Uh, so, okay. you know, you talked about Chris Coleman being yeah, on here. Yeah. You know, I love, you know, anytime I'm around one of the chefs, um, you know, I'll ask them a question about something, about how they made something. I constantly mm. want to learn. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing would probably be a vet. I love animals. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm terrible in science, but um, <laughs> love animals, love rescue dogs in particular. I have a soft spot for my wife and I's hearts. Nice. Awesome. And if you could meet anyone past or present, who would it be? This is always a tough one. I think I would go with Obama. Mm. Um, just his ability to lead yeah. um, is, is pretty special. Um, athlete wise, I love Tiger and LeBron, so they would be yeah. a close second and third. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you think you'd ask him about if you were to meet Obama? If I was to meet Obama, um, probably just overcoming some of the challenges he had to, you know, um, you know, I'm sure there were times where being a black man was very difficult in that position of power and he always handled it with such grace and such dignity yeah. and, um, you know, he, he just, he has this ability to say the right thing at the right time with the right tone. Um, and he, you know, I hope in my lifetime I see another orator as good as him because mm-hmm. when he delivered a speech, yeah, it's just, mm-hmm. it was incredible. Yeah. You have a favorite moment from that, like, uh, that you're just describing? Like, um, I can't help but think of the speech he made at, down in Charleston at the AME church yep. after that when he wow. broke out into song right after the I remember 
we're at this transitional point at the post where design was becoming much more important. And it was the night he claimed the Democratic nomination. Mm. He had just given this great speech. Mm. And I wanted to run this basically portrait of him on the front page, very large. And he he just looked presidential to me. And it was Mm -hmm. very tight on his face. And at the Washington Post at that time, we did not do that. You did not run a magazine type photo. You ran a news photo, right? You had to show that he was in front of a podium and that he actually gave the speech. I remember this was our retiring editor. I remember showing it to him. He said, you can run that photo inside. You can't run it on the front page. Mm. And I I just, I don't know why. I was 27 years old. I must have had a wild hair up my ass. And I was just like, Lynn, I think you're wrong. <laughs> you know, here's one of the most accomplished journalists in our, in the history of the Post. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, let's, we're, demo- we're a democracy. Let's yeah. vote on it. Okay. And so he brings over to like, you know, rounds up eight people. Yeah. And I remember it was eight to one. Oh. Uh, and my favorite. In your favorite? Okay. Yeah. And so, like, okay. that page, like, I remember the speech he gave that night and just being so moved. Um, you know, and it had been such a long primary for him and Hillary. It was very yeah. close, if you remember. Um, you know, he's just, Obama just has this way with people that I, you know, try to emulate, try to capture. But like I said, he, he knows, if you follow him on Instagram, just anytime he writes anything, even about St. Patrick's Day the other day, it was just like, he, he can step back and really capture hmm. the essence of a situation really well. We've prepared a few cups for you here. We're going to play a game. We're going to have uh, four different bourbons for you to taste. I am coming off of finishing a little pour of George T. Stag, which is 130 proof. So <laughs> try to suck down some water here. Wash your mouth out real quick. <laughs> yeah. I don't want you contaminating this highly scientific experiment. All right, yeah, so we have one, two, three, and four. The bottles in contention are in no particular order. We have an old granddad in the mix. We have a wild turkey rare breed, a chicken cock, and a burning chair, uh, which is a store pick from my Darby's. I love burning chair. I love their bottles. I think um, (laughs) their branding and marketing is really cool. Um, So I'll just, uh, I know we're also filming here, so I'll give just a little few things I like to do when I'm tasting multiple things. Okay. if uh, you already know this, so I'm not trying to insult no. you, but... Um, <laughs> for the listeners yeah. that, that may not have never For, for that. Caleb over here who yeah. knows nothing about it. Yeah. Um, so one thing, whenever you're going to go smell a bourbon, this is very important. It's easy to put it up to your nose and just take that big suck in. Mm-hmm. Make sure your mouth is a little bit open because if not, all those alcohol vapors get stuck in your nose. Oh. And that is actually what burns is those alcohol vapors. <laughs> so if you have your mouth open a little bit, the alcohol vapors can move out and you will not get that wow, this is really hot. Um, <laughs> this just in, all liquor that's 80, 90, 100 proof is really hot. Um, you can help yourself out. So yeah. You heard it here. So I like to just always smell, mix mm-hmm. it around a little bit. Any particular notes on this one? Yeah, this one's definitely got a little bit of caramel for sure. Definitely some leather. Oh, you do like the sound Try to get a l- We get the ASMR aspect of this. <laughs> Try to get... Um, some air in there, you know, you can kind of taste it on the front of your palate, the middle mm. of your palate, and then on the back is, you mm-hmm. know, if you're going to get burned, it's always on that back side. Um, this one's definitely a little younger. That's quite a bit of oakiness on the back side of it. Uh, I'm going to guess it's in the 90 to 95 proof range. So we'll, we'll see as I go through. Okay. Number two has almost some mint on the nose. It's really mm. interesting. I'm interested just listening to this. Mm-hmm. Number two is also a little younger. Got some strong oak, a little bit of minerality to it. Kind of doing a little bit of the Kentucky chew here, trying to there you go. almost chew on it, see what I can pull out of it. Kentucky chew. Yeah, you, I don't know what that means. All right, yeah. So <laughs> for the listener, a Kentucky chew. Yeah, so after it kind of goes down, you have that lingering aftertaste. You can mm. kind of move your tongue around. Mm. Got it, got it, got it. You know, and kind of do that second swallow. Mm. This one feels younger to me just because the alcohol feels more pronounced. Mm. Um, you know, maybe more in the three to four year age range mm-hmm. and probably higher proof than the first one. I could be wrong on mm. that, but there's a, a little bit of a warmth going over me on that one. Okay. Number three is very sweet. A lot of, lot of like caramel creme brulee notes up front for me. Definitely this one feels like the biggest proof of all of them so mm. far. 
Are there any that you do not like or care don't care very much for so far? No. You know, again, I think bourbon like wine, it's it's very preferential mm-hmm. and um it takes work to be able to identify stuff. I still don't think I'm great at it. Um, there are certain brands you put Jack in front of me, mm-hmm. you put Booker's in front of me. There are certain brands that mm-hmm. have very distinct characteristics. Mm-hmm. Um, a bourbon to me has to be really, really rough for me not to like it. So mm-hmm. it's either got to be really young or just, you know, sometimes you get a single barrel or a store pick. And I remember uh, I had a friend, he's like, you got to try this. This barrel is truly awful. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? And I smelled it. And he, you know, when you leave laundry in the washer for too long, and it's got like, <laughs> like that mildew, mildew yeah. like that funk. I remember taking the cap off and doing the, the nose smells like, he told me it smelled like, um, uh, like your shirt after playing basketball, oh like that God. sweaty, Ugh. stinky. And like, to me, it was like that mildew smell. No. Um, but one of the hardest things, I, I've read this, one of the hardest things for your brain to do is to be able to smell something and be able to connect it to a food or a flavor. Mm. That That is like a, a great brain tease. Yeah. Um, you know, so so I just tell my wife, like, you do the New York Times crossword puzzle. I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm, here I'm drinking I'm, bourbon. I'm, yeah, I'm, like, a, we're both doing brain <laughs> teasers. <laughs> Very sophisticated. What are your thoughts on four? Four is pretty plain to me. Mm-hmm. Um let me let me drink some more water no. here, but not a lot going on. Hmm. Might be the lowest proof. Do you generally prefer a slightly higher proof? I am a high proof guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that I drink a little more for, I take back the proof thing. I think <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's 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 I'm definitely feeling more of that proof okay. this time. Interesting. Just seeing you do this, I don't know how people do this for like when they do like ten or eight to ten or something. I don't know how you could possibly. So like when I one of the great tricks when we um, picked a barrel of new riff for my group, um, we brought a couple uh, people with us, and one of them was Ryan Hart, who is at that point the bar manager at the Crunkleton, really prominent bourbon bar in Charlotte. Gotcha. Um, and so Ryan, you know, you have five new riffs in front of you. Mm-hmm. And all of them are different single barrels. And one of the tricks he showed me that I thought was really good is he kind of played like, like mm. almost like it was like an equalizer or a sound system, right? Oh, like yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. how do I like them? What do them? I like? What do yeah, I like? Yeah, and he yeah, was yeah. just constantly tasting them, moving them up and down. <laughs> so, yeah, let's do the equalizer then. So what's, what's jumping ahead, in your opinion? So I really like one, that is for sure. you got to drink a lot of water. <laughs> Yeah, you got to drink a lot of water if you're going to do this. Mm-hmm. Two is definitely like very clean, not a lot on the back side. I'm sure I'm going to do terrible at this. Just like I, I, no, I, you can't do terrible. This is your opinion. I, I'm moving the cups you're back and the forth. Road, yeah. yeah. All right, we'll we'll see how I'll, I'll put some guesses out sure. here. Oh, you don't have to. Oh, yeah. If I was going to say rate them in in order of your preference first, and if you want to so take say, a guess, I would say one is by far my favorite. Okay. Two, three, and four all kind of blend together a little bit for me in different hmm. forms. Okay. I'm going to guess one to be wild turkey. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're one for one. All right. That's pretty good. Um, wild turkey rare breed is number yep. one. All right. So, Is that one of your favorites? Um, so I'm not a huge turkey guy. Turkey has a cult following. Um, yeah. Some of my buddies mm. love wild turkey, especially vintage wild turkey. So yeah. vintage is basically anything pre-90s. Gotcha. Um one of the things that the turkey had, like, when you showed me those four, mm-hmm. I don't know the age statements of all of them, but in my mind, I thought turkey was probably the oldest one up there. It's probably one of the highest proofs. Yeah, and, and the proof is definitely higher. And so, you know, when you get higher proof, um, my guess is 115 on this, 116.8. <laughs> wow, pretty close. <laughs> pretty yeah. you nailed the proof there on the guess. Yeah. Um, right. You know, so... When you are higher proof, that means um, it's not being cut with water. Right. Right. So, like, Jack Daniels is generally around 86 proof. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, their black label's 80 proof. They're pulling it out, and then mm-hmm. they're adding water to get it down to that proof. Yeah. Well, if you add water, you're also diluting the flavor a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a... Right. Um, so part of the reason I love bigger proof. Yeah, you're getting more, more, more full You're flavor. getting something more close to the yeah. original product. I exactly. Guess. Yeah, that's what you mean. Um, so some little terminology. If something is barrel proof, that means whatever it came out of the barrel at, 
is what That's their servants what to you. Yeah. Um, if something is foolproof, that means if they put it in at 115, they bring it out and they get it down to 115. Mm. So um, a lot of bourbons lose their um, can lose their proof, uh, you know, as they come out and get watered down. Mm. When they're in the barrel, they actually gain proof generally mm. because water is coming out of the barrel okay. because of the heat. Um, let me do, yeah, so I'll try to do two, three, and four. Favorite, we'll yeah. see. I've, I've at least gotten one, so I've not totally yeah, I mean, embarrassed you, myself. You've, you've killed it so far, so. All right. You don't have to guess, though. I mean, you knock yourself uh, out guessing them, but like, do you have, I'm wondering if you have a preference here on two, three, and four on what's, what's next best. Three just starts off good, and then it really hits hard at the hmm. end, hmm. the more I drink it. I'm going to guess four to be old granddad. Okay. Oh, well, you're incorrect. Oh. Four. Four is chicken cock. That's what she said. <laughs> sorry, four is chicken cock. I, I was away from the mic. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, is do you have a second? Is that your second favorite? Here, that was probably my that, second favorite. Interesting, because um, you started out not so sure about that. Yeah, one. and then I'm going to say two was third, and three was probably fourth. Okay, interesting. So let's say I'm going to hope two is old granddad and three is burning chair. Two is old granddad. There we go. Nice. So nice, and then three is the burning chair. Okay. All right, three awesome. out of four. Not you, you helped me a little bit though because you you I eliminated let you know a few. What they were, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, so at a blind fun. tasting, you did prefer the rare breed over uh, the other three here, but I would also say if we were going to a liquor store, the rare breeds probably costing the most. So yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, the, the other three are pretty much same price bracket, honestly. Yep. Like like. As far as the MSRP on them, uh, Old Granddad, very easy to find, very affordable. But Old Granddad Bonded makes the best old fashioned. For those of you trying to make, if you, when you're making an old fashioned, one recommendation I give you on bourbon is look at the proof. Yeah. Um, and so if you like a little bit of a stronger old fashioned, go for a bonded bourbon around that 100 proof. If you want something a little lighter, you can drop down. Nice. nice. Okay. And talk a little bit about bonded whiskey for, or bonded. Yeah, so bottled in bond. So bottled in bond. Um, this was uh, back in the 1800s. Uh, bourbon was um, just unregulated, yeah. and so you could buy Charles whiskey <laughs> and. And I just sell you any old. Well, slug yeah, I mean, like I might know what I think yours is, but yeah. I could take that barrel, yeah. and people did all sorts just of horrible things. They would, add, them. you would hope they would add water. <laughs> there are, there are. I've read in books where they're adding chewing tobacco, oh my gosh. chewing tobacco spit, like <laughs> things to add flavor that oh, you man. would not ever want to drink, right? Oh, gosh. And so, um, I could be buying a bottle of Charles's whiskey, but. That's been bootlegged or handed down so many times that by the time I get your product, it might not be what your mm. product was intended to be. So the benefit Bo of bonded is that you're, you're doing this in a facility that is... Uh, government regulated. Government and so regulated. the Bottled in Bond Act, I believe of 1896, was passed by um, or was chaired by a man named Edwin uh, Hayes Taylor, Colonel E.H. Taylor, as we know him now. Gotcha. And uh, he is the grandson of President Zachary Taylor. Oh. And so he was, he's one of the grandfathers of bourbon. And he felt like if he was going to move product um, from the famous Taylor Distillery, which is now where Castle and Key is, hmm. he wanted to ensure that if it had his name on it, it met his standards. Hmm. And so um, to be bonded, you have to be at least four years old. Uh, you have to be 100 proof. And... There has to be um, a government regulation of some sort. And so that's why there are tax stamps, the old strips that were put over the tops of bottles. Mm. And so if that stamp was broken, that was a sign to you that gotcha. this whiskey could have been tampered with. Hmm. Gotcha. And so we got rid of the tax strips in the uh, early 80s. Uh, but if you go um, buy a bottle of Colonel Taylor now, part of the reason they have, the, they have a faux tax strip over uh -huh. it is an homage to him because that is... Nice. His invention. That's cool. Very cool. So what's the big benefit of still having the bottled and bond situation? Now? You know, is it more just kind of a, now a it's just, cool thing Now, to now know? it's just like, more nostalgic, right? Yeah, because yeah. like... Because you, know, you still have regulations. Like yeah, I mean, this was before the be FDA right, existed, right? right? Like there was no FDA. Right. And so, um, you know, now it's just you're producing a whiskey that's four years old and 100 proof. Right. It's so, just sort of like a federal statement yeah. to back it up. Okay. But I would say, you know, if I'm making an old-fashioned at home, I we keep... Um, two bourbons specifically for that. 
um, Rittenhouse Rye. If you are a rye person, it's a great rye you can find for around 30 bucks pretty much at any store in North or South Carolina and then Old Granddad Bonded. Nice. Well, we appreciate you stopping by today, John. It's been a pleasure. This uh, is great. Thank you, guys. final thoughts for our listeners? Um, you know, the thing I always say about bourbon, I've got kind of got three rules. Um, it's meant to be shared. <laughs> Uh, it's meant to be drank any way you like it. So mm-hmm. if you like it over ice, drink it over ice. If your buddy doesn't like it over ice or does like it over ice, don't judge them. It's their their preference. Okay. And bottles are meant to be open. They're not trophies. All so right. those are my three kind of kind of rules. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so yeah. much for swinging by. We appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Stick around next week and see what we talk about on the Bandit Room. Bandit Room is a production of Span Enterprises, located in sunny Rock Hill, South Carolina. We've been developing, supporting, and growing successful IRS e-filing and business management solutions since 2010. Go to SpanEnterprises.com now to learn more. The views and opinions expressed in the Bandit Room are those of the guests, and do not necessarily reflect or state the opinions of Span Enterprises. No information should be considered as tax, legal, or other professional advice.